The College of the Muscogee Nation is a monument to our ancestors, and we truly believe that. SJ, this is Colt and Matt from the College of Muscogee Nation. In this audio series, we want to share the many stories that contribute to the history and progress of CMN. And we're going to be speaking with founders, key stakeholders, Muscogee officials, citizens, and students. We're going to try to give a multi-perspective look into our development, where we came from, and where we're heading in the future. In today's episode, we have Dr. King. He's a career educator, an original visionary and proponent for the college, the first president of the College of Muscogee Nation, and current region director for institutional effectiveness at CMN. We've been looking forward to this too for a while now. Matt and I have a lot of great respect and love for the college here. And so anytime we get to learn about the college, it's something that it just kind of puts a spark in us. So we've had anticipation for this probably for about a month and a half, two months now. So I hope you look forward to having this conversation, listening to this conversation with us. Um, let's just get into it. So just a, an opening question here. Mm-hmm. What does education mean to you now? And how has your perception of education changed throughout your life? Well, first of all, I might want to tell you about where I'm, I'm from. I, I come from Okemo, Oklahoma, which is in the uh, west part of the Muscogee Creek Nation. That's where I grew up. I went to a uh, Creek community church, Baptist, all my li- life. My parents, they spoke the language. They would speak to each other, but uh, they would speak English to us. And uh, I asked the question, uh, why did you do that? And they're response was, well, we wanted you to be able to understand English. So when it came time for you to go to college or go to high school, go to elementary school, you wouldn't have such a difficult time. But they did encourage us to know the language. And so what's so important to me is the fact that they wanted us to get an education. And once we graduated from high school, my brothers and my sister They said, okay, you've reached your pinnacle as far as we are concerned, but, you know, where you go from here is on your own. And so then I went off to college and and graduated from East Central State at Ada, Oklahoma. That was back in 1968. But what education means to me is to learn, to experience, and one of the most important things that I learned while I was in college is to solve problems. You know, uh, not only what you learn in the classroom, but there were issues that came up outside the classroom. And so in dealing with those issues and how to resolve any problems that you might be facing was an important part of the education, as well as your relationship with other students and your interaction with your faculty and staff. And so those are all an important part of education. For us here at the College of the Muscogee Nation is to give the opportunity for our students to come to the uh, College of the Muscogee Nation here in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, which is the capital of the Muscogee Creek Nation and have an opportunity to get that education, whether it's an associate degree, whether it's a certificate, and then go on to a career or to a advanced degree. And so we have several of our graduates, and Colton is one who came here and received his degree, or shortly will receive his degree, (laughs) but he also has a bachelor's degree from uh, East Central, and then will continue on with his doctorate, as well as Matt here. But uh, education to me is the key to making progress and to being able to meet the needs of your family, your household, those kinds of things. I'm still looking forward to the honorary degree, Dr. King. <laughs> You'll get it. You will give it to you. That's um, good. You really gave us insight into what education is to you. My thought as we were thinking about this and we talked the other day is you were raised in a time where we start to see some of those real true first effects of historical trauma. And as we've studied that and we look at it and 
a lot of different facets of life. We see education suffers some of the most within those that historical trauma part. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like education was really important in your household, which is maybe some some part of a abnormality to all Indian life at that time. My thought is, did you always feel like you were going to go further than just having a high school diploma or even in your household where it was supportive? Did you think maybe I won't make it through high school? Like, what was your thought process through all that? I, I never I never thought about whether I was going to college or not. When in high school, one particular day, a person from the Bureau of Indian Affairs came to our school and asked to speak to the native students there. And so I was one of them, and so I went to meet with that person to find out what kinds of programs they provided. But the issue that I faced was one that was expressed by a teacher in the English class who said, where's he going, you know, whenever I left the room? And she said, well, he doesn't need to go there. He needs to go to uh, Oklahoma State Tech if he's going to go to school. Not that I was college material, and I thought that was a strange remark that she would make since I made A's and B's in her class. And so I was able then to find out about funding that would be able to be provided to me if I did choose to go to college, which I did at that point in time. And I wanted to be a coach and a teacher. At the end of my career at uh, East Central State, I wanted to go out and, and coach athletics. And also, I had a minor in English, so I suppose I would teach English. Or also, I had a minor in industrial arts. So I had a wide variety of uh, areas in my minor degree to teach in. So I look forward to going to college. You know, I didn't know what it was going to be like. My dad went to Bacon, but it wasn't a college that he was attending. It was like in high school. And then my brother went to Bacon, but it was his first year in college and played football for Bacon and played on their last football team that Bacon College had. As you got into college, did you immediately know that you were going to want to work in some kind of educational field? Or did you follow the traditional freshman, come in with a bunch of big ideas, and then eventually weed your way down through where you were? Really, I didn't have any big ideas because <laughs> it was it was really a new experience for me. And, and like I said, I wanted to be a coach. And, you know, that's, that's the direction that I was heading. One of the things throughout my life, I've always had to work. Our family family encouraged to work. Our tribe encourages work. If you look at our seal and you see that plow, you know that we're workers. And so while I was going to college, the year before I went to college, I worked on Interstate 40, helping to build that, pouring drain ditches, shoveling dirt, doing all of that in the hot sun. And that was something that was required of our family members. We were not allowed to lay in bed on uh, on the weekend, and, and uh, with our folks, they would come and say, if you don't have anything to do, we'll find you something to do. <laughs> and so then the second year, I worked here in Oak Mulgee with A&M Electric on uh, putting up uh, highline poles, stringing wire, those kinds of things. And I worked with some Creek citizens, and one of them was Will Sampson. He was one of the on one of the crews. And then uh, whenever I went to East Central at Ada, I worked in a packing house. And uh, I worked in the smoke room. I didn't tell them I was a college student because they wouldn't hire me for the summer, you know. So uh, they thought I was going to be a full-time employee. So I worked in the uh, packing house smoking bacon, smoking hams, making uh, lard, which at the time, was supposed to be just fine. As we know now, it's not very healthy. And then I got a job working at the uh, motel as a maintenance person and a desk clerk. But I had to do that to help supplement my uh, education expenses. And so those were the things that I was having to do to uh, get my education. And while working at the uh, motel there in Ada, a gentleman who was with the Johnson O'Malley Department of Education, State Department of Education, was told that I worked there and that I was native. And so he came and talked to me and asked if I wanted to go to work 
as a coordinator for the Indian Division of the State Department of Education. And I said, yes, I would like to. So I interviewed and I met with the State Department of Education superintendent at the time. And so I was hired and I was able to work with the students in the public schools in Oak Fusky, Oak Mulley, and Creek Counties, which is in the Muscogee Creek Nation. That gets us there. So when did this first idea of a tribal college for the Muscogee Nation start? When I was working at the State Department of Education Indian Division, I met a gentleman named uh, Dr. Bud Samat, and he was one of the administrators. And he went to the University of Minnesota to work and complete his doctorate in a special fellowship program for Indian administrators, school administrators. And so he called me after he had been there six months and let me know that there was a vacancy available and if I wanted to come to the University of Minnesota, I could be accepted, which I did. And it was in December that I told my family we're moving to Minnesota. And the day I told them, we gathered up our furniture, whatever we had, put it in a U-Haul and headed for Minnesota in the middle of winter. I had some of my friends, I left my furniture in the house, called my landlord and said, I'm I'm leaving to go to school. And I said, I'm not running out on the rent or anything. He said, oh, that's not a problem. You're okay. And so he was fine with that. We uh, drove to Des Moines, Iowa that night. The next morning, we got up and went to uh, Stillwater, Minnesota, which is where my friend lived. And we found a apartment there in that apartment complex, which is where I lived while I was working on my master's degree at the uh, University of Minnesota with other Indian administrators. During that period of time, I had a course that was titled Two-Year Colleges. And in that class, I asked the professor, Dr. Don Morgan, if he would let me write a paper on the development of a college for Muscogee Creek Nation. And he said, yes, he was kind enough to do that. He was a liberal instructor and liked new ideas. And so he went along with it. And I did make an A in his class. But that paper served as the concept and the foundation for the college that we have now. As you develop that idea in that class, we've all completed our master's degree in other classes. You know, we've had those classes and those projects that we build. At that time, as you created that, did you think that was something viable you could actually bring here that somebody would listen to you become more than just a project for a class? I really did. And the reason I did is because there were other Native people in the program that I was in that their tribes had community colleges. One was Santa Glesca at Rosebud, South Dakota. The other one was Turtle Mountain, which is in North Dakota, Bismarck. And so I felt like we could do that. And I did pursue that, not immediately, but over a period of years, I worked on it. And friends of mine that I've known, they said, well, James, you were talking about this college back in the 1970s, and you never gave up on it, and you continued. And we did make a few attempts, but we had no funding from the tribe. The tribe at the time did not have casinos like we have now, you know, where we're able to have budgets for projects like that. But we did do a few things that would initiate the development of the tribal college. Matter of fact, this friend of mine that I mentioned earlier, Dr. Bud Samant, he was athletic director and one of the administrators for Oklahoma City University. And he and I worked on the idea and he presented that to the regents of the state in higher education. And they said that that's fine, you know. But the problem was the cost of tuition. We would have no way to take care of the tuition cost of students, and it was very expensive at OCU. But that's as far as we got with the idea. We had a catalog. We had some course outlines. We had some uh, syllabi, but we were not able to get to the point of actually offering the courses. That was back in uh, the late 1970s that that took place. How would you describe the reaction from the tribe initially and how that evolved as you pushed forward? Well, really, I don't think they fully understood 
what we needed to do and what we could do. But I think money was the driving issue. And so the only way that we've been able to be successful at it is through the support of the council and the principal chief. But what we did initially, whenever we began to make progress and the tribe had more money coming into their treasury, we were able to hold a meeting with all of the council members and some of the community members who were interested in finding out about a community college for the Creek Nation. We had a a huge dinner at OSUIT. They all came and we presented the idea to them and we let the council know at the time, once you agree to this idea, it's going to continue. You will always be asked to provide funding for the college year after year. And after they heard that, we thought, well, if they don't buy into it, then that's good because they will know that they have to be committed from now on to it. And they did. They voted all in favor of it. What did you feed them that night that made them change their mind? I think we... I fed him chicken. <laughs> but, but that was, you know, one of those banquet dinners that you'd have. And, and so, and, and I think we had salad and things like that, you know. But uh, we had a slate of speakers, you know, that would come up and talk. Then they would ask questions and we would respond. And I presented and uh, Mr. Flood presented. And uh, I think it was Mr. Wilson presented. And there were several of us that talked about the benefits of a college. But chicken was the clue. (laughs) So moving past the initial bringing the idea to the tribe, what was the Skokie public reception when they first got wind of it? Was that after that it had been voted for or did it leak out beforehand? Well, one of the things is um, you still hear people say, I didn't know we had a college. You hear that to this day. And we've done what we could to let people know that. We did a needs assessment in the very beginning before we started the college. We wanted to find out what was important, what was the need, what kinds of courses we would offer. And so what we did find out, three major needs that that came out of that. Number one, accessibility. The people who responded to that needs assessment, they told us, we want a college that is local. We don't want to send our students to Weatherford or to Tahlequah. We want them to be able to attend college here. Financial aid was the other. And they knew that it would be out of reach if they had to pay for their child to come to a college. And so that's whenever we established the process for financial aid that we would not have any loans that would be taken out by students. It would all be paid for by uh, tribal funding. And one of the things that one of the uh, tribal council members, his name was Keeper Johnson, and he is now passed. But he said, I want this college to be free. And, and he used the word free. I think we still have issues with that. <laughs> but we want this college to be free for our students who are Creek and that we will provide scholarship funds for them. So he and I went to a tribal council committee meeting, and I prepared a budget for it. We showed that to them and asked their opinion, and they agreed that, yes, this is something that we want, and they presented it to the full council. And they provided us with scholarship funds for the first few years that would go to Creek students. That was a major goal for us to achieve. The third thing that was mentioned is the degree programs. And those degree programs are the ones that we started with. Uh, We had tribal services, gaming, police science. And police science was necessary because one of the issues that we were having is the council passed legislation that said all light horse police would have to have degrees. And so that's what this college was doing, was meeting the needs of the tribe as well as the light horse police to get their degrees. And those were our first graduates. And we were able to do that through an arrangement with Oklahoma State University Institute of Technology, where they let us use their transcripts and our courses. So whenever they had a transcript, it would show OSUIT, but we would also have our name on it. Mm -hmm. 
it was kind of a thing that we we had to do because at the time we didn't have accreditation. I think I still have some of those transcripts. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. I think I have one or two that still has both. OSUIT and you see them in. Yes. When we partnered with OSU, mm-hmm. what was that process in seeking out, you know, accreditation partners? Being a new institution and not having that footing in the ground. And being Muskogee, we sometimes have a problem with pride. We don't like to lean on others. Yeah. What was that, that process in trying to find a partner to work with? At the time, principal chief was Perry Beaver, and he, he talked to President Smidley of the OSU Stillwater Campus, and he asked them if OSU could help us get a tribal college. And so they agreed to do that, okay? And I was at Northeastern State University. I was nearing the end of my career there. Then I came here in 2003 and started working on a plan and a process for us to do whatever we could to meet the requirements that OSUIT would have. One of the things that we needed was classrooms. We needed offices. We needed student services for our students. And so we had the library, we had the cafeteria, we had some of the housing that was made available to us. So we were able to put that into an agreement, that an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, that they would provide that to us as well as transcripting. Bob Klobinish was the president, and so he worked with us, very kind. Jerry Wilson was one of the department heads, and he was also a tribal member and he was very involved in it. Then I was there working and pulling it together and pushing it. And so we had a little work study group that we called actions of the board or so to speak of this committee and say, okay, we'll accept this. We'll do this. We'll go along with this. And so we were able to do that with the understanding that we would eventually get our own campus and get our own accreditation. We had a site visit from the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, and they told us, you guys will never become a member unless you get your own campus. They didn't like the idea of us being on the OSU campus. And we did have a building, which was an old social security building that the tribe bought for us, and we used that for administrative offices. It wasn't big enough for offering uh, classes in. So that's where we were at that point. What were some of the early years as you're building this up? You have, I believe we started out with the language courses, and I think you said the other day we had Native American history. As you have those early courses, what was it like navigating that space and trying to make sure this stays afloat, but also trying to build towards, you know, where we're sitting here today? You know, one of the things that we were able to do, and and this, we were still at OSUIT, we offered two classes for our first trimester. That was in the fall of 2004, and we offered a course of Native American studies, and we had beginning Muscogee language. Uh, Those two classes had a total of 27 students in there. So one of the things that the tribe did for us is the principal chief was A.D. Ellis at the time, and he gave permission for employees to come to our college and attend class before five o'clock. We were able to do that. And so through their support, most of our students came from uh, Muscogee Creek Nation staff and employees. That was 2004. We went six years before we were able to move here. But we purchased this property from OSU, and and we had to go before their board to buy this land. I remember walking out onto this property. It was a hay meadow. And so looking around and, and thinking how this would become our campus. And at the time, I think it was like 15 acres. And so we're up to over 40 acres now. I think Dr. Randall tells a story of when he was the intern and having to come over here to snap a photo of the the land. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think he said that he has had a hard time conceptualizing that this was going to be a college, that this was just an empty field Mm -hmm. next to a highway Mm -hmm. with nothing here. And to look at it where we are here today and, you know, who knows in what time somebody's listening to this. But I mean, what we have here is amazing. I mean, from 10 years ago when I was a student here, even just having this one building was some of the nicest Mm -hmm. college 
material college mm -hmm. buildings that I'd ever been in mm -hmm. and to see it evolve and know that we're continuing to push forward to expand and to provide these uh, facilities for our students. Mm -hmm. It's no small feat that we are still the only accredited tribal college in the state of Oklahoma. That's true. That's true. That's a big dream. What further growth or expansion do you expect from the college in the foreseeable future? I think the, the potential is great. You know, right now, and we want to pursue bachelor's degrees. That's going to be a difficult process for us. Dr. Randall and I talked with our liaison with the Higher Learning Commission, our accrediting agency, about the, and I brought it up to him. I said, we want to establish a bachelor's degree program in our Native American Studies program. And he was shocked a little bit. And, he, and then he did mention, he said, well, after Dr. King dropped the bomb on me about you guys wanting to offer bachelor's degrees. But we're ready to do that. There's a lot of work. But one of the things... And we've hit a little bump now, which is uh, we had planned on getting funding from the HUD and from the tribe to build that facility that would allow for expansion of the library and for housing the Native American Studies degree program and archives. So we did not receive the funding for that, but that doesn't stop us. You know, we can go back again or we can pursue some other avenues of funding for that. So other potential, I, I don't believe that we would stop there. We're going to go on master's degrees. And at some point, maybe even professional degrees, and you guys would be a part of that. I would see being able to offer a law degree or being able to offer engineering. At some point down the road, I see those things happening here for the Muscogee Creek Nation. It's a very exciting time to work for yes. the college to see the, the growth mm -hmm. at this pace. It is. It is. You know, I always, I think I, I get the, maybe the appreciation to come in here in a different perspective than just about every instructor here, because most of them were not students here. And to come back and to see things in motion, and I think maybe that's a little bit what drives my activity here at the school is I don't view it as I'm not coming in eight to five. There's some days I'm here till seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. But I see the greater mission. I think that's what was instilled in me when I was here that there there was no it wasn't five o'clock and that they were gone. It was a community here. Mm -hmm. And so every community needs people who are involved in it. I know for myself that's what drives me because I, I can see it. It's it's almost like they're already there. And you know, I know what I have to do to play my part to push that there. And I think that's what really motivates me. I may, I know I leave here a lot of times. The time I get home, I am tired. <laughs> All my energy is yeah. gone. My wife looks at me and she's, <laughs> she's like, what are you, how are you awake? And I, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I said, but I come here re-energized every day and mm -hmm. give it 110%. And I think that's what this environment calls for. It's, it's not for anybody who is here to collect a paycheck. We're all in. And I think our students feed off that. We have seen through our activities and stuff that we've done with our students. We started off like they didn't really know who we were, but now we have this rhetoric with them that they want to come see us. We hang out and talk and mm -hmm. we see them down the hallway. We check in on them. They come see us when they have problems. And only that, they're telling other students about what's going on. And so we're slowly building this community and seeing it grow in amidst of COVID and trying to battle all that and all the problems and hurdles it puts in our way. It just really brings a great space here and that the space that you created here that, you know, we only have as far as we can set it. You know, we're going to push it on. That's that's something I'm excited for. You know, and, and you, Colton, are a great example of what we wanted to achieve here. We could point to you and say, look at Colton. And you can relate to those students because you're coming from where they are now. Once you get that doctorate, I mean, it's going to be even a greater influence on them. And to know and believe that they can achieve whatever they choose to with your help and, and the help of Matthew as well. And you're right. I think you two, with your youth and with your enthusiasm and energy, I think that's the most valuable thing that we have here at the college. 
You know, I always take that quote from Mr. Bible that we are every student here. And I mean, I take that to heart because that's how it was when I was here. I remember coming in this school as a student and had a 1.5 GPA. I'd felt almost my first year of college and mm-hmm. came here and sought a second chance. And without the support that were here, some of the same instructors that are still here teaching when nice. I was when I was uh, here, you know, without their support, I always point to uh, to Ronnie Sands. If it wasn't for him, I would have never passed college out mm-hmm. Mm. And I would never got to where I am today mm. in, for that one class. It's just things to look back at that. And that's, you know, that's what I want to give. And, you know, it's, it pushed me to greater places. And so I see a lot of myself and a lot of these students when they come in here. And, you know, Ronnie Sands was one of the first faculty hires that I made. Of course, there were two or three others, but I remember him coming. And he's from the same hometown or high school that I went to. And so Ronnie always called him Oktaha. You know what Oktaha is? Sand. That's what it means. So I called him Oktaha. Yeah. But one of the things that I always say, too, and, and you guys mentioned uh, quotes, you know, and, and we haven't said anything about this at this point in the discussion is our ancestors. We always have to acknowledge our ancestors because they persevered. They lived through the removal. And whenever the soldiers came to their homes in our homeland and said, you have to leave, they survived. They survived. And they came here and they contributed to what we have now, the Treaty of 1866, which we use as a foundation for many of our grant proposals, which says that we can build education facilities in the Muscogee Creek Nation. And we say that. And so we always go back to that treaty. That's our foundation, our ancestors. One thing that I always say is the College of the Muscogee Nation is a monument to our ancestors. And we truly believe that. Going back to the culture for a second mm-hmm. and, and the environment we've built here, we were adopted into. I know that you had a large part in setting that up originally. Mm-hmm. What was the intent there? When we were, were you going strictly by Muskogee cultural values that we founded of the college? Or did you have your own vision for the type of environment you wanted here at the college? And, and you know, even back in the 1970s, I had designed some degree programs, which is like tribal services and Native American studies. I included some of those courses in there at that point in time, but we didn't have the college then. But I took those and then used those in our plans whenever we developed the college in 2003. I also identified those courses back in that 1973 class, two-year college. So it's just kind of come with us over the time. But I knew that to be a tribal college and a college for the Muscogee Nation, it would have to have an influence of Muscogee Creek courses and Native American courses as well. Those had to be blended into our curriculum, not only to do the academics of general education, but we needed beginning Muscogee language in there. We needed a Native American history course in there. We needed a tribal government course. And those kinds of things are going to help us develop and maintain our sovereignty for the Muscogee Creek Nation. Very much so. As we've kind of talked about vision and mm-hmm. culture and all this stuff about the college growing, and as we're sitting here in 2022 mm-hmm. and in 25, 30 years, you know, maybe up to 25th, what do you think the college is going to be like? What is your vision for the college that far? And I know that's 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 pretty far off, but you know, what are what are your your visions for that? I see it still being here for sure, mm-hmm. yeah. and and I see new leadership. I see new students. I see a larger campus. I see the support of the Muscogee Creek Nation still with us, and there will be new and different challenges. We're going to have to deal with the environment. We've got to deal with the political atmosphere that we live in now. Those kinds of things will have to be addressed, and I will hope that there would be solutions then to those kinds of things, you know, and there will be new new things for us. But the strength of the tribal college will continue to exist. And what you are doing and what I am doing is establishing a legacy, okay? 
what people think about us, what our students think about what we did. Whenever they came into your classroom, how you taught them and how you related to them, you are building a legacy. And that's what our ancestors did for us. They built a legacy for us. And that's why we're here today. That's what will happen 50 years from now. So the legacy that we establish now will continue to carry on and will continue to meet the new challenges that are set forth. We're coming up on the, what, the 20th anniversary of the college, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so as we hit that. Two years. Yeah, we we hit that mark. Your original visions that you had for this, as you look back, do you feel like you've fully accomplished that? Is there still some more left to accomplish? Have we, we jumped above that? It took that seed of that paper to evolve and to develop. The way we've gotten to where we are now is not solely by one individual, but by groups of individuals. And us pulling and pushing and working and studying and developing all those things to build this college. And so right now, you become a part of that as instructors, as leaders in student organizations. It's been a group effort as we go along here. And there are people that I've talked with, they say, I love this college. I've never heard anyone say that at a mainstream institution, but maybe I've not been <laughs> That's around true. That But this institution is such that it gets you in the heart. You feel good about it. It's family. And one of the things I remember, and it goes back to whenever we were at OSUIT, and I was president at the time, and we had some students come in, and they said, Dr. King, we want to talk to you. And I said, okay, you can talk to me, but the first thing I want to talk to you about is I want you to graduate. I want you to leave. So many of our students get attached to staying, and they want to stay with us, but they can't. They need to go on. They need to go on out there and benefit the tribe and their family and their friends. But anyway, they asked me, they said, we've got this instructor who teaches certain things to us in the classroom. And then whenever it comes test time, they don't test anything about what we've been taught. And I said, well, let me tell you this. And I have taught in college before. I said, just because an individual teaches at a college doesn't mean they're going to be a good instructor. So have you talked to the instructor? And they said, well, no, not yet. And I said, go talk to the instructor. But there was about four or five students that were standing there. I said, but don't go as a group. Go as one individual and and find out what the issue is. The important thing is you need to go and speak to that instructor. And that's the thing that I've mentioned, problem solving. So often our students don't know about problem solving. Rather than solve a problem, they leave and you say, well, what happened to Joe or Jim or whatever? Well, they left. They had a problem that was solvable, but they didn't confront the issue. I think that's a big issue we still face today. And I know for a lot of us, we try to tell them, you know, our door's open. Is there something going on? Like, I had an incident today that said, well, you told us to read this. And I said, <laughs> well, if I did, I don't know what I was thinking. But, you know, we have it on D2L there. I said, that's the right thing. See, even if I say it wrong, that's the right thing. You have it there. I said, but if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And, you know, we'll move on. And so, you know, we just we worked with it. But I've had students since I've been here that just they see the slight of problems and they want to hit the door. Mm-hmm. You also talked about students wanting to be here. Mm -hmm. When I started here, I wasn't hardly connected with anything tribal whatsoever. I was very disconnected. As far as Creek Nation goes, I lived out of boundaries. So I'm Seminole in Creek, and even with Seminole Nation, at that time, they just weren't very active. I think, you know, had a lot of governmental issues going on, and there just wasn't a lot for citizens um, as a whole. When I got here and after leaving here, you know, I've always looked to this place as feeling like a part of home. And since I don't really have a lot of those strong cultural ties, I've always looked at this as when we talk about tribal towns, I always think about this, like, 
like this is mm-hmm. this is where I belong. Yeah. You know, this is where I tie my culture to. Is mm-hmm. is here? I think that's a lot with a lot of our students who don't have those traditional boundaries tied to them. That that's why they feel like here because this is you know we build this. Our ancestors wanted us to. Right. We get that Indian community. It's a supportive system and empowering system. Mm-hmm. Complete opposite of regular. Mm-hmm. I think that when our students say that, I have the same, like you said, tribal town type mentality about the college. I, I know that that will go on. That's one of those things that once you build it, it takes as long as that vision did to build that that overall community. And it's an amazing achievement. But oh. We're a valuable entity of the Muscogee Creek Nation. We're the higher education function for the Muscogee Creek Nation. I don't know how many people realize that, but in time, it will be well known that we are. And whenever students consider us as a first option, whenever they get out of high school, when we first started the college, our students were primarily employees of the Muscogee Creek Nation. But as we grew and as we developed, we found that we were attracting more traditional students, the recent high school graduates. So now what we're finding is probably a significant percent of our students that are starting here as freshmen are going to be high school graduates and that's a great thing for us to know that they have chosen us to start here for their higher education. So encapsulating everything we've talked about, what is the most important piece of advice that you would like to pass on to future generations, whether that be future students or Muskogee citizens? Consider higher education as a valid option for yourself. And you may be the first family member to go to a college, but that shouldn't stop you. That should encourage you. And then whenever you do that, other family members, other friends will see that. And then they will then continue on with their education here at the College of the Muscogee Nation. We just want to build this. This is a real opportunity. And I don't know how many people look upon us as being an opportunity. But one of the things, too, is the fact that you can get two years of education with a emphasis on Muscogee Creek history, language, and culture, and not owe any money. You can't do that very easily in higher education. Then whenever you start and go to another college, you've got some room to fund that education for a bachelor's or master's or doctorate. That's that's what's going to be most important. As we wrap up, you know, I want to thank Dr. King for coming okay. and sitting with us. This is not a, a short feat. It, it took a lot of planning to get everybody together and mm-hmm. uh, find a spot within the school and, and all this stuff going on. And so we just want to thank you for your time. Thank you for the important part you played within the school. And continue and to play. Continue to play that make the wheels run around here sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so we're just thankful for you and thankful for the great conversation that we had and, and look forward to the other interviews that are going to come after this. Yes. And if you're listening to it 20 years from now, we told you so. (laughs) (laughs) And I appreciate you. Thank you, Dr.